um, presentation now. Just move this control over here. Um, all right, so I'd like to welcome all of you guys. Thank you for coming. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I've got a fabrication shop here in Massachusetts, and I've been very fortunate over the years to uh, have the opportunity to make some, what I think are some pretty cool projects. Um, here are just a couple of them. I made, um, one time I made a dinosaur. It was about nine feet tall, uh, all out of plywood. Um, this was for a trade show that it kind of had a science fair sort of theme. And um, the, the people that wanted this, they said, oh, let's make one of those little balsa wood dinosaurs. And they said, can you make it like a couple feet tall? And I said, how about nine feet tall? And they said, that would be amazing. And then the next day, we had a, uh, we had a dinosaur built. And when I, when I built this thing, there's actually, you see it in a warehouse here. Um, I put it on wheels so I could roll it around and store it. And I used to move it onto the, uh, the loading dock. And the truck drivers were none too pleased to open the uh, loading dock every morning and being stared down by a big wooden T-Rex. So that was a fun project. Um, I did an arcade machine a year or two ago that's actually still here in the shop. That was to um, demonstrate SketchUp, kind of put it in a fun arcade machine. That actually had a fog machine in it as well. But the reason why I'm showing these projects is because I think they're cool. Um, I had fun making them, but also a lot of this feeds and speed stuff that I'm going to show you, I use in making uh, these projects. I also did uh, this one a year ago, um, or multiple years ago, I should say, not a year ago. At the time, for like a couple month period of time, we had the world record for the largest wiki house on planet Earth. And as you can see, didn't take much to crack that record because it was a pretty small house. But um, this entire house was cut on a CNC machine. Um, and we actually had ShopBot in North Carolina cut this uh, for us. Um, and we did the design work. And um, this is a huge undertaking. This is 150 sheets of plywood. Um, we had it shipped from North Carolina to New York. A bunch of people put it together who had never done anything like this before. Um, this was really fun. Um, and it worked. And if we had had um, better, uh, better feeds and speeds, uh, we probably could have cut all these parts in, in less than, whoops, less than two weeks. Um, and so a, uh, let's see if we can mute this video here. So another thing that I work on is because of all of this stuff, um, I've been making software to try to make uh, CNC fabrication faster and better. Um, this is kind of the only sort of advertising thing that I'm going to do. But basically, I make a cloud-based cam software that will take a 3D model like this. Um, you can upload it to our cloud service. So you can kind of select your pieces like this, upload it in. Uh, you tell us what kind of machine and material you're cutting on. It will calculate all of your feeds and speeds for you automatically, um, so you don't have to think about it. Um, if you do want to put in your own, you still can, but um, we typically can uh, help you figure it out. And for cheap good stuff, we'll kind of nest all the parts for you and create a G code or ShopBot code um, right in the cloud. So we just rolled this out uh, about a week ago. Um, we're looking for people, you know, if you, you want to buy it, that's great. If you want to come help test it too, we're looking for testers um, as well. So if this is something that um, interests you, uh, that would be, uh, contact me afterwards. We'd be happy to, uh, to have you. But let's get into it. Let's learn about feeds and speeds. So uh, what are feeds and speeds? Feeds are the amount of material that the bit on your CNC machine is cutting and speeds are the speed that you cut it at. Pretty simple. Um, I decided to do this webinar because I hang out on the Facebook groups and the Reddit groups and all this stuff. And you go to any forum, any Facebook group, anywhere people are talking about CNC machines. And one of the most popular questions is, how do I figure out how to cut this material? How do I do it on my machine? And I think that um, this is understandable that this is a popular question, but I think people are often asking the wrong questions. They're looking for the, the answer, which is, I get it, right? You want to know how to cut Baltic birch, or you want to know how to cut HDP, or whatever it is that you're cutting. But I think the real answer is how you figure out how to do it, because every machine, every bit, every material, everybody's cutting preferences are all different. And that's what I'm going to show you here, is how to actually figure this out. Um, if there was a book that had every published feed and speed for every material combination, I would definitely give it to you guys. But unfortunately, that doesn't exist. Um, so to figure this out, where you need to learn about, and we're going to learn about here, uh, different bit types, different material types, and the capability. Um, so let's let's jump right into it. 
Um, we're going to use uh, three different kinds of machines as examples, kind of a small desktop one, uh, kind of a four by eight, you know, shop bot sized machine. Um, and then this one here, a big multicam, sort of uh, an industrial router. So you guys can see the, you know, the differences in between, um, you know, how feeds and speeds work on these machines. But the method to calculate the feeds and speeds is the same, no matter if you're on a giant multicam or a little hobby machine you have on your desktop. Um, so let's talk about machines, right? This is, um, you know, these are very general graphs, but essentially the faster you move your machine or the faster your cutting speed is, the less power you have available to cut. So if your machine can move at 200 inches per minute, let's say, that's what the manufacturer says that it can move at, that is when it has the least amount of power to cut through material, okay? Um, and this is, again, a general graph, but it kind of gives you the idea. More speed equals less power. Your machine is at its highest power when it's actually parked. Um, that's when those stepper motors are, are exerting the, the highest level of torque. Um, the speed that you cut very much depends on the thing that you're cutting. So we're, again, we're going to talk about this you know, a few slides later when we get into this. But let's say in your CAM software, if you're using you know, our software or Aspire or VCarve or Fusion 360 or any of these things, if you set a cutting speed to, let's say, 300 inches per minute or 6 inches per second, however you do it, if you set that speed on this sign to the left here, these are little tiny details in this sign. So your machine is never, ever going to come close to that full speed that you set it at. So you need to take that into consideration when you're calculating your feeds and speeds. Um, some machine, the, the interface for your machine will actually show you the, the real speed that the machine is moving at. I know ShopBots don't do that, but a lot of the uh, mock powered machines and centroid powered machines do that. Um, alternatively, on the right, you see this picture here of the CNC machine cutting out all these cabinet parts. These are big rectangles. They have big straight lines. It is very likely that this machine gets up to full speed. So whatever the speed, the, the maximum speed that you set the cut at. Um, let's say it was 300 inches per minute. This machine very likely gets to that full speed for a good majority of this cut. So something to keep in mind, um, you know, when you're sort of figuring out the speed of your machine. Um, the cutter heads on, on machines, that's something uh, you need to take into consideration as well. There's typically, you either get a router or a spindle. Some of the lesser price machines come with a router and they're oftentimes are just hand routers with the, uh, with the base removed and put in. And you know, again, this is kind of a general graph, but the way these things work is the less speed you have a router set at, the less power that you have. So when you're running that ro uh, router very, very slow, it's at a very low power. And when you increase the speed all the way up to the top, you get the most power. And you have to take this in consideration too, because um, you, you might not be able to run your router at a lower speed to get the chip load that you want, which again, we'll talk about chip load later and also routers oftentimes when they plunge into a material they will slow down so you need to sort of keep that into consideration too is you might set it at 20,000 rpm but while it's actually cutting it might be spinning at 14,000 rpm or something like that um, if you have a spindle on your machine like an industrial spindle or even um, you know it's one of those uh, kind of cheaper water-cooled spindles spindles typically have a nearly flat power curve. And what that means is that at just about any speed you're running a spindle at, you have the same amount of power. And this is kind of a generalization. Um, if you really want to dig into this, you can oftentimes look up the specs for your spindle, but you're typically going to find is that they make peak power at just about any speed. And what's really nice about a spindle is when you set an RPM, it is set at that RPM. And when you cut into material and the spindle gets bogged down, the spindle will pick up the pace to hold that speed. Um, so you can often maintain your chip load you know, a lot better um, and more consistently with the spindle. Um, all right, so on to bits. There are a million different bits out there. We're gonna go over four of just the most popular ones to kind of break these things down into categories. Um, we could do like a seven week seminar, eight hours a day on every kind of bit that's out there, but I don't think anyone would wanna stick around for this. So, um, but luckily I'm gonna show you how to find the bits that work best for your job. So um, for end mills, which are you know pretty popular bits, one of the most common ones is an up spiral bit. So if you look at uh, this diagram here, 
they, um, let's check one thing here, okay. Uh, when you look at this diagram here, um, on routers, 99% of the time they spin clockwise, unless you have a very weird router, like an Australian one or something, um, they will spin clockwise. And the, the, an up spiral bit, when you spin it clockwise, is going to pull the material up to the top. And so the good thing about this is that it very efficiently removes material. You know, when it's, when it's pulling it from the bottom, pulling it out of the top, it can get up and out and away from the material into your dust collector um, very, very quickly. Um, these are really good on plastics, on metals. Um, they can be really good on wood as well. The downside to an up spiral bit is that they exert a lot of pulling force up on the material that you're cutting. So you gotta have good hold down um, and no matter what material you're cutting. And if you're cutting like a, a veneer or a laminate, um, you know, or like a nice hardwood, um, sometimes it can tear out the top surface because it's pulling all of this material straight up. Um, so that's kind of the downside uh, to an up spiral. Um, let's go back over here. Uh, the opposite of an up spiral is of course a down spiral. So when you spin this uh, clockwise in your hand, the flutes are gonna be forcing the material down into the cut. And these are really, really good if you are making pockets. Um, so if you're doing like, um, you know, a pocket for a guitar neck or, um, you know, some other kind of pocket into wood or plastic, these things make a very nice finish on, on pockets. Um, they also push the material down into the table. So if you're cutting, like I cut a lot of thin sheet plastic, uh, down spirals can be really good for that because that thin plastic oftentimes um, has a tendency to get pulled up by an up spiral bit. So these can be really helpful. Downside is, is that you can't drill with these at all. In fact, you can't even use them um, in tight spaces because they're jamming all of the chips down into the cut. And if you try to drill with one of these things, um, it can jam up your, you know, your Z-axis trying to push down. And in some cases, I've seen people actually cause fires uh, like this. So you have to be mindful when, when you use these things. Um, I've experienced two on down spirals, even ones that were meant for plastic. Sometimes you can see some melting because they're pushing the chips back down into the cut that you've made. Um, and as we'll learn later, chips carry heat away, which is uh, crucial to getting good cut quality. Uh, the straight bit, you probably have seen these things. Um, these have flat flutes on them. There's no spiral to them. Um, they're good for pockets and um, general purpose work. They're pretty inexpensive. The surface finish usually isn't that great and they tend to be a little bit weaker because they don't have like a spiral structure holding them together. Personally, I'm not a big fan of these. They're, they're kind of not great at anything. Um, what, it, what is good about them is they're inexpensive. So if you're kind of learning and practicing, these can actually be a, um, you know, a really good bit. Or if you're doing something that maybe is a little, you know, you might run over a screw or something like that, these can be ones that you won't feel too bad about if you break one. Um, and last one that, uh, one, one that I'm personally a big fan of is the magical compression spiral. So if you haven't seen these things, this combines a down spiral and an up spiral. So you get um, the most of the, the bit, this top portion, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse pointer here, but um, the top portion is a down spiral. So you get a good top finish. It won't tear up your veneer or your laminate. Um, and it's pushing down on your material, but the bottom half of it is an up spiral. So it's pulling up from the bottom. So you get a good finish on both sides. I often use these for cutting furniture grade plywood. Um, they remove material pretty efficiently. Again, good surface quality on both sides. Uh, downsides, they're more expensive. Um, they do require a deeper plunge. And um, they usually require a beefier machine because oftentimes you have to stick these things down um, deeper into the material to get that up spiral portion down into the material. Um, and they're typically not good for, um, for plastics. Um, I'm on the phone. Um, all right, sorry, I had somebody knocking on the door. All right, um, and the other thing we need to know about bits is the flute geometry. And this may sound complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, you'll find when we're looking at bit specs, which we're gonna do in a minute here, um, the flute count is important. So here we've got a three flute, and you can see one, two, three. Here we have a two flute, one, two. Um, you won't always see a diagram like this, but in the specs, you'll see um, typically a number of flutes, and that directly affects the chip load and the speed that you can cut uh, with, with a bit at. So um, we will uh, talk about that in a minute. Now, uh, I want you guys, if there's maybe one thing that you sort of take away, um, I, I wanna give you my swimming analogy. So 
the idea of getting the right feed and speed is a lot like swimming, okay? So imagine yourself swimming across a lake or a pool. You wouldn't swim by holding your hands really, really close to your chest and paddling super, super fast and you're like barely reaching in front of you. You also wouldn't swim by pull, uh, reaching your arms as far out in front of you and pulling as hard as you possibly can for each stroke. What you want is somewhere in the middle. You want to reach your arms out far enough that you get enough water, but not too much that you're straining yourself, um, that you can move efficiently through the water so you can swim across the pool or the lake or the river without burning yourself out or getting too tired. And that analogy is actually really, really applicable to how you think about setting up your feeds and speeds. You want to carve away enough material that you're being efficient, not too little that you're getting hot and going too slow and not too much that you're overstressing, you know, the bit in, in, you know, in your arm. So think about that as we, as we go through. So uh, the next section here, this is going to be all about chip load and how to figure it out. So if you have the, this is my magical chip load graph. Okay. If you have the correct chip load, everything is great. And you'll be happy like this guy in the middle. If you have a low chip load, your bit is gonna get really hot. It's gonna wear out really fast. You're gonna get burned and melted cuts, chance of fires, and then just general, there's gonna be general misery. And what low chip load is, I see this happen a lot for people that are first starting out on CNC, is they'll turn the spindle speed all the way up and they'll do the cut speed really, really low because they wanna make sure they cut through that material and they're getting a super low chip load and they end up having all of these bad things happen. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you have too high of a chip load, so this would mean that you are spinning your bit too slow and you are moving too fast through the material. You can break bits, you can stall out the machine, you can have bad cut quality, and your tears of misery can stain your work. And you don't want that either. We definitely want to be like this guy. Be right in the middle. All right, so let's, uh, let's put all of this stuff to the test. Let's actually set up a feed and speed, okay? So let's say you have this little Avid Benchtop Pro here. So um, I checked out the specs for this machine. They are advertising the cutting speed to be um, 200 inches per minute. Now, I'm going to guess and say that they're probably advertising the absolute maximum speed that they think that this machine can cut at. So um, right off the bat, I'm going to cut that speed in half. So I'm going to say the realistic cutting speed of this machine is 100 inches per minute. Okay. Now, let's say we want to cut some plastic, something like this, some HDPE or some ABS. Um, and let's say that, you know, this has an aluminum uh, bed, so I've got this material bolted down, you know, pretty well. I've got some clamps on it. I really don't have to worry about it lifting or pulling up. Um, so I'm going to go over to a bit website, just happen to check out a mana tool here. This is not sponsored or anything like that. Um, and I went in, and, and this website, uh, this is toolstoday.com, toolstoday.com. Um, they categorize everything by different bit type and material. So I went in here and I found uh, the solid plastic cutting spiral O flute bit. And they say this is recommended for plastic. It's an up spiral. We know it's going to pull the chips out. Um, so let's take a look here. So we've got some specs on this bit. And so you might see um, an actual cutting speed. And, and I typically don't follow these because it's a really general number. They don't know what machine we're cutting on. I mean, this same bit could be used on a big multicam industrial machine and our little desktop one. What I'm really after here is the chip load. So let's take a look at this quarter inch bit here. Uh, they're saying the chip load is uh, 0.008 and between 0.008 and 0.0112. So what do you do with that? Well, you put it in a chip load calculator. And so where do you get a chip load calculator? Well, if you're on a mock controlled machine, you might have one built in. And if you're on many other machines, um, you might not have one built in. But thankfully, I have made you a chip load calculator. Uh, and here it is. And I will be um, providing this chip load calculator as a link uh, later. And it's free. You guys can you know, use it right on the website, download a copy it yourself. So this is, uh, this is totally free for you to use. Um, so. The bit diameter we know to be 0.25, okay? So we're gonna put that number in here. Now, the depth per pass. The way this typically works, we go back and look at this spec. It says um, operating RPM, 18,000, and it says depth of cut, 1x tool diameter. And what that means is as a rule of thumb, the depth of your cut should equal the diameter of your tool. 
So our depth of cut is already set at a quarter of an inch. Now I have a, a speed, a cutting speed in here of 150 inches per minute, but I wanna see what happens when I try this at 100 inches per minute. And we know that the chip load on this was between points uh, for the quarter inch, 0.008 to 0.012. So I'm gonna go to, um, I'm gonna go to 0 0.001, kind of be somewhat in the middle of that number. Okay. So we're gonna go 0 0.001. Let me just make sure that was right. Was it two zeros or one zero? Two zeros. I'm a little bit, a little bit low here, so we'll make this two zeros. Oops. And this has one flute, and we're gonna see what happens at uh, 18,000 RPM. So if we look down um, in the solved for chip load section, you'll see it kind of repeats the values here to make sure we got it right. So if we were to cut on this machine uh, at a uh, quarter inch per pass at 100 inches per minute, our chip load is gonna be 0056. So that's, um, no. <clears throat> Occupied. That is not quite right. Let me just go verify this number is right. 008, okay. Um, so our chip load is a little bit high. So let's see what happens when we fool around with the numbers. So we're a little bit low. Oh. Why do I feel like that number is not right? <laughs> Hang on one second, I just need to reread it here. 0 0.008 to 012, okay. I did put it in wrong. I'm sorry, I felt like that wasn't right. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so if I cut at 100 inches per minute at a quarter inch per pass, we're gonna be at half the recommended chip load you know, for this bit. So this is where you can kind of fool around with the numbers and see if this is the right bit. So let's see what happens if I drop down the RPM to 12,000. Well, that chip load is gonna climb up. That means I'm gonna be taking away bigger chips of material. So you can see here that I'm moving closer to the number that we need. 120, okay, that's gonna get me right there. But if I go back and, and look at the, um, whoops, if I go back and look at the specs here, they're recommending an operating RPM around 18,000 RPM, and I'm pretty far off from that. Um, so this might not be the right bit. So let's see what happens. Let's maybe go back to 16,000, and let's increase the speed to 185. And you can see here that I've gotten um, you know, pretty much right on this chip load. But I'm really, really close to the claimed maximum speed of, of this bit. So I think this bit could work on this machine, but this does not leave me a lot of room to slow down if I need to. I'm really, really, you know, kind of getting at the top range of this machine. And as we know, the faster you go, the, you know, the less power that you have. So I could do some other things here. I could um, change the depth of cut. Maybe I could go half. By 125 and I could drop the speed way down and there you go this seems like a reasonable number so I'm I'm much closer to you know the advertised speed here maybe I drop down to 100 rpm 100 inches per minute and there you go so if I do half the half of the depth per cut the middle speed of my machine I'm now at essentially the correct chip load so this is how I'd want to cut with this bit um, let's say I went to an eighth inch bit so this one is, we'll say 005. So let's try this one. Let's double check that speed. 00 for the eighth inch bit, 005 is right in the middle. Um, and this one works pretty well at this speed as well. So the eighth inch bit would work really well. And the nice thing about the eighth inch bit is that I'm dead in the middle of my range. I can increase things a little bit. I can slow things down a little bit, say, go like that. And I'm still kind of right there where I need to be. So I get a little more flexibility um, in speed and power from an eighth inch bit. So I hope this first example makes sense, but um, there's, there's not like a magic formula for each of these bits. You kind of need to make some judgment calls um, and figure this out. So let's try another example. Let's go to a different machine here. Um, let's say you've got a larger larger machine like this, uh, the ShopBot here. So they advertise, uh, if you've got one of the higher end ShopBots, the Alpha machine, um, they advertise a cutting speed at 600 inches per minute. Let's say you wanna cut out our friend, the dinosaur here, okay? So I would go on here, I'd find maybe an up spiral because this dinosaur, um, I don't care about the surface quality in this one because I did, um, uh, I did round over the edges on this. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna pick a, let's pick a 3 8 inch bit. So this 3 8 inch bit requires on plywood a chip load of 
0064. Um, and they're recommending a 230 inch per minute feed rate. So let's see if we can get that. So we're gonna go here and we're gonna say 0.375 for a 3 8 bit, 0.375. Um, we're gonna say 230 inches per minute and the chip load just escaped me. That is gonna be 0064. Put that in here. Playing. All right. So let's see. So at this speed and at this depth per pass, we are significantly above the chip load. Hey, I'm on a webinar. Yeah, or, or you can throw it on the cart if you if you want. I'm like in the middle of teaching a class though, so it's all right. Um, the um, uh, sorry, I'm getting <laughs> getting material deliveries as we speak. Um, so if I set this 3 8 bit, 3 8 inch per pass, 230 uh, inches per minute, which is their recommend cutting speed. This is the chip load per tooth. Um, let's see how many flutes this is. This is a two flute bit. So let's make sure we set that correctly. And at this speed, I'm at a little bit too high of a chip load. So let's see what happens. If I increase the speed to 300, um, I, my chip load increases a little bit. So let's decrease it to 200. Um, and I'm getting closer to that number. So um, if I increase the depth per pass a little bit, now I'm getting right there to that chip load. And this seems like a totally reasonable number to cut with this machine with, because the maximum speed was 600. I'm cutting at 200. I'm taking away a lot of material. It seems reasonable to put a 3 8 bit into, you know, soft plywood, 0.4 inches, 14,000 RPM is good. So. This bit will probably cut great at these settings, but it also leaves me a lot of room to experiment. So let's do one last one here. Um, let's actually try, let's try this one here. So this is a, a flat uh, three flute bit, and let's see what happens if we try to run it on the shot bot. So um, this, is, this needs a, uh, for plywood, a .009 um, chip load per tooth. So let's change this. And this is a quarter inch bit. And this one's a three flute bit. So this is gonna be interesting to see what happens. So they want 009. If I cut it 200 inches per minute, I'm only getting 004 chip load. So a little more than half of what I need. So this is not good. I, if I ran into these speeds, I'd probably heat up this bit um, and burn it out. So let's try altering some numbers. Let's say I cut half inch deep. Um, that's not going the right way for me. So let's say I cut at uh, 0.125 inches deep, that's going to get me closer to where I need to be. But if we kind of step back and look at these numbers, I'm using a quarter inch bit. I'm only cutting half, half the depth in soft plywood. I'm cutting at a third of the speed that my machine is capable at. So this would work technically, but I don't think this would be an efficient way to, oh, yeah. to cut with this bit. Um, Great, and uh, oh, and last example here. I'm sorry. I'm just going to burn one. people here. Yeah. And then um, Chris said he gave you. The All right. There we go. Um. So let's uh let's try one of these big iron machines. So this one has a rated cutting speed of 1800 RPM. This thing is a beast. Um. Let's say we want to cut some plywood. Whoops. With uh with this one. So we're gonna go find a compression spiral. Um. Let's get a half inch compression spiral. So. Uh, we're going to make this 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, this compression, this half inch compression spiral in plywood has a 0 0.0077 chip load, 0 0.0077. Um, and this is a, they have a two flute and a three flute version. So let's try the two flute first. And let's set our cutting speed at 900 inches per minute. And let's see what happens. So this is um, about half of the recommended chip load, uh, you know, from this. So we've got we've got room to go here. So let's make this um, much much deeper. Let's increase the cutting speed, drop the RPM, and I don't know. I mean, we can kind of fool with these numbers here, and we can get it to where we want. Maybe a thousand. So we're getting closer, but look, I'm getting up to the, you know, nearly, whoop, not 18,000, 1800. 
Um, I'm at nearly the top end speed for this machine. I'm just getting to the chip load. Uh, that we need in this. So what this probably means is that we can put a bigger bit in this thing and we can cut faster. We can cut slower with a bigger bit, but cut more material, cut deeper. And that's what I meant. Um, so I hope this kind of puts uh, this feed and speed in perspective. So um, how do you figure out if this stuff is working, right? Well, the first thing to do is to start, you know, do your research, find your bits, pop it into a chip load calculator. This is going to get you in the ballpark. It's going to help you figure out, you know, if you're, if you're even close, right? And then after that, you really got to just go try stuff out. And so some things to look for when you're cutting wood, especially, you want to make chips, not dust. So you don't want fine sawdust. You want big particulates, not too big, but, you know, big enough that it sort of reads as sawdust. And this goes for plastic, which it goes for aluminum as well. And the reason why is the chips carry away heat, okay? And they show that you are, you are getting that right kind of chip load. That is why it's called chip load. It's not called dust load, okay? So that, that's a good indicator. If you're getting burned bits at all, um, that means that you are very, very likely way under the chip load that you require to be cutting. Um, I've had bits that I have run for years um, they're dull, they're, they're getting duller, but they show no signs of burning. And that's because those are ones that I've been running at the right chip load. Um, if you're running at the wrong chip load, a burn bit like this can happen in minutes. Um, it can happen over hours, can happen over the course of days, you know, depending on how far off you are. But if you're seeing any kind of burn bits, um, your speeds and feeds are not correct. Um, last thing, um, and this is hard to telegraph with audio, but if your bits are screaming, especially in wood, that means you need to feed them. If it screams, feed them. That means they're not getting enough material. Um, so that means cut faster and increase your chip load. So um, with that, I'm going to unmute you guys, and I'm going to go find the chat box here. Actually, I'll stop the, stop the share so you can see my pretty face. And let's look to see if we have any questions. Um, uh, let's see. So, um, and if anyone wants to, uh, you guys have the ability to unmute yourselves. So if you want to unmute and like shout out a question, go ahead. Or if you, um, you know, are shy and would rather type it in the chat, I'm happy to uh, answer them out of chat as well. Um, so let's see. Uh, so SB says, I have a mystery bit in my toolbox. Can I look up a similar bit on a mana and get the chip load specs? That's a good one. Um, Try, uh, actually, I have it right here. So I have some mystery bits as well. And I have one of these little loops, lupe, I think. It's just a little magnifying glass. Um, sometimes if you look really closely on the shanks of the bits, you can see uh, numbers on them. If there are no numbers at all, um, I guess why not try? Um, there's, I mean, if you really start looking at bits, there's not too many different styles of them, but make sure if you're gonna do it, um, count the flutes look at the angle of the flutes, like the plastic ones they showed often have a, a very, very quick angle going up the top. Um, those are typically for plastic. The wood ones have more of a kind of more spirals going around. So you might be able to figure it out that way. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, I don't have a, an exact answer for you, but I guess if it's a mystery bit anyway, you may as well give it a try. And if you punch in some uh, chip load calculations, um, you know, you kind of know if it's making chips and not dust and it's not screaming and it's not burning, um, you've, you've kind of nailed it. So um, any other questions from anyone? I'm just looking in the chat here. Um, we had one question in the beginning. If anyone joined late, um, I will be posting a recording of this. It's going to take a few hours to render and upload and do all that stuff. So I will post a recording uh, so you guys can go back and see this. Um, and I will actually paste the link right now. If anybody joins and you didn't register, um, thanks for coming. Uh, but I use that registration list to email you guys back, like the chip load calculator um, and the recording links and all that stuff. So if you didn't register, you can actually still go register right now. Um, just go drop your email address in there and I will make sure that you get um, the information. So um, let, me, uh, let me unmute. Maybe I... I'll go click unmute on a few people here. Is there um, anyone that has uh, any questions before 
Oh, thank you. Lindsay says she likes my machine calculator much more. Thanks, Lindsay. I tried to, uh, I tried to simplify it um, as much as I could, you know, and just make it. A lot of the other ones, um, they don't allow you to fill in all of the, you know, the fields. And you can get this one kind of out of spec, but I like to play around with it. So hopefully um, this helps for you guys. I will post instructions too on how to copy this. You can use this in Microsoft Excel um, or Google Sheets. And again, you know, it's free to take and use. Um, and I hope it, it is a helpful calculator for you guys. Um, oh, Hi, Eric. Eric, one question here. Yeah. Take one by audio. Uh, the Spectra bit that you showed had a range for your for your chip loads, but that one specified that it was a plat or a bit designed for plastics. If you're using a bit that's not necessarily designated as plastic or wood or whatever, uh, where do you how do you address the different types of materials? Like plastics, do you go on the lower end versus the high end, or how do you adjust based on materials if it's not a material specific bit? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So a wise man that I, I know over at Shopbot, uh, Bill Young, has been a friend of mine for a while, and he's probably one of the best CNC fabricators that I know. Um, he, he said to me once, he's like, you know, any bit can cut anything. I mean, he's technically correct, right? I mean, I suppose if you wanted to, like, you know, drill through a big rock, you could take any bit, and as long as you ground it on a rock long enough, it would, it would eventually cut through. Um, but to answer your question more directly, um, I've definitely used plastic bits on plywood before. Um, and I've used plywood bits on plastic and probably a lot of other things that you are, you know, shouldn't do. And what I've, and I've done this for a variety of reasons. There's probably been like some late Friday night where I snapped off a bit. I had to finish a job. I didn't have exactly the correct bits. So I grabbed something else and used it. Um, what I found, if you use a wood bit on plastic, it will cut. Um, and typically what I'll do is I'll go with kind of a plastic, you know, find like a similarly sized bit, similarly sized fluids, go with the chip load that matches plastic. And going back to the advice that I gave, as long as I'm making good plastic chips, it's not gonna affect the bit, you're not gonna ruin your bit, right? So you're carrying the heat away, the thing's moving through the material okay, so you're not gonna like burn up your bed, you're not melting material. What I have found using a wood bit on plastic is you can, you can see the cut quality on the side of the plastic, it just isn't super good. It's because those bits weren't meant for that. They're yeah. weighed a little bit, or it's just the very, you know, very particular geometry of a wood bit on plastic doesn't work that well. Um, the other way around, if you use a plastic bit on wood, and plywood in particular, um, I've done that before and it's worked fine. I kind of just go with the plywood chip load. And, and actually to that end, so, if I use like one of those O-flute, like that Spectra bit I showed, um, if I use one of those on plywood, it seems to work fine. Sometimes you get a little tear out at the top of using an up spiral. Um, but like, you gotta think of, sometimes you need to think of different materials as different things. So I cut some ePay a few months ago, and if you've ever dealt with ePay, it's like as hard as aluminum. Really, really heavy stuff. Like if you don't pre-drill every screw, you'll snap a screw off in it. I actually used an aluminum chip load on that because that stuff is so hard and it worked. Um, I got some good cut quality and I used a plastic bit because a lot of the, not all, but um, a lot of those plastic bits, uh, you can actually use them on aluminum as well. That one that I showed, I don't think they had an aluminum spec for it, but some of the Onshrewd ones that I do are kind of dual purpose plastic and aluminum. And I actually used aluminum chip load on ePay wood, if that makes sense. Um, let me move on. I've got a, another question here. So uh, do, 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 do. let's see. Someone says, I tried to cut circles. This is from Connie. Um, I tried to cut circles and they came out lopsided. This is a speed thing. Um, I'm very new to CNC. So um, this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but um, what I will say very quickly is it could be a speed thing or it could not be a, a speed thing. Check the, check your, if you're getting, you know, essentially what I think you're getting is circles that are like either squished or the, you know, they're lopsided. I guess you can't really have a lopsided circle, but maybe it's some lips turned on its side. Um, what I would recommend doing is taking a bit, flipping it over so the smooth side sticks out, chuck it up into your spindle, um, have your spindle off, grab onto it, and wiggle it back and forth and make sure that there's no play in your machine. Um, 
maybe do an air cut. Just make sure there's no play or something mechanically loose. Um, and maybe back off your cut settings a little bit because your machine might be a little bit flexible and getting pulled into the cuts. Um, one more question here. Saul says, can you recap the part where you said if your machine has feed limitations the, um, and the adjustments that you can make? Um, my machine only moves 150 inches per minute max. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, let me go back and, and do that really quick. So that's actually pretty easy. So what I was saying is if you go back to your machine specs. So let's say you have a machine like this. This says it has a max cutting speed of 200 inches per minute. I typically go with whatever the manufacturer says is the max spec, cut it in half. So when I do that chip load calculator, I would do something like this. So I do 0 0.25, 0 0.25, set the cutting speed to exactly half, set the chip load you know, accordingly. And if you can get your machine pretty close to the right chip load, here the chip load for this bit is 0 0.005. And at 100 inches per minute, which is half of the cutting speed of this machine, we're, we're already at 0 0.004. You're in pretty good shape. That means you're going to be able to dial this bit, um, you know, right sort of in the middle of your machine's capability to make it work. Um, so hopefully that uh, makes sense. And let's see, we have any other questions? Ah, how do you gauge the end of life of your bits? Um, and when to throw them out, turf them, or when to when to have them sharpened. So um, I never have bit sharpened, and here's why. If you have a bit sharpened, it changes the diameter of the bit uh, down a little bit, typically. And um, you can compensate for this in your cam software. Um, any cam software can do this. And the problem I have is I will inevitably forget uh, <laughs> which bit I put in, because I don't have a tool changer. I just have a rack with a whole bunch of bits in it. And there is no way of me knowing if I pick up what looks like a quarter inch bit, if it's actually 0.242 inches in diameter instead of 0.25. Um, I typically don't buy very expensive bits. And in most projects, I, you know, multi-sheet or, you know, kind of larger projects, I build the cost of the bits into my projects. So kind of my bits are all paid for. So I just use them until they wear out. Um, and then I toss them. Uh, but to answer the second part of your question, how do you know if your bit is worn out? Um, there is not a magical test for that, but this is how I do it. Get a brand new bit like this. Before you ever use it, take it out of the package and rub it along your thumbnail. And, it, and very lightly, don't do this very hard. You don't want to cut yourself out. Rub it along your thumbnail and you're going to feel how it's going gonna, it's gonna to carve against your thumbnail. Just very, very light pressure. Then pick up a similar bit that you've used for a long time and do the same thing and feel the difference. And that's how you're gonna know um, if your bit is worn out. Also, you can watch the cut quality. Um, you know, and part of the lesson I'm trying to teach here is, you know, consistency. So like I cut plastic every single week on my machine, the same plastic at the same speed. And I know uh, when that bit starts um, losing its cut quality because I see the, you know, the quality fall off. If you're not cutting things regularly, you know, do a fresh cut, get it dialed in right, take a picture of the cut, um, throw it in a Google sheet and write down your feeds and speeds and show a picture. And then six months, a year later, when you go back to that bit, if something's not right, check your feeds and speeds, look at your picture. If you're doing the same feeds and speeds and the same material and your cut quality is garbage, that bit may be worn out. So um, that's another, uh, and I actually do that. I have, uh, I have a spreadsheet full of feeds and speeds and pictures and you know, all kinds of stuff. So, um, let's see, is there any other, any other questions out there? Um, you feel free to Eric, either chat or unmute, go ahead. Eric, one more, kind of back to your, the mystery bit question. If you have a bit and you're not sure of the uh, composition, whether it's a HSS or a carbide, and you're trying to go online to find some, and you're not even sure of the manufacturer, but you want to go online, find a similar bit, uh, how much difference, uh, based on the material composition of the bit, i.e. a high-speed steel versus a carbide, how much difference will there be in the, in the bit load? I mean, if you, if you assume that it's one versus the other, I guess you, you play it safe, and, and if you can find a high-speed steel version of the same bit, you start there and then work from there for chip loads, or, because I do have a few, uh, I'm probably like others, I have a few of these mystery bits too that you've either inherited or somebody's passed on to you that they weren't using, and, you just want to make sure you're, you know, I guess get, getting maximum usage out of it. So yeah, no, that, that's a 
that's a good question. What what I would do, it, and you kind of saw me do this on the on the chip load calculator, is you know they, they usually give a range on chip load, and I just usually start in the you know the middle of that range. What I would do, if you've got like a like a single flute, you know what looks to be a plastic upcut, you don't know if it's um, HSS or carbide. Um, look up a similar bit in both HSS and carbide, and take the average uh, chip load between the two. Um, and just start there and because what you're going to find with a lot of this stuff is that um, there's just there's such a range and you know a lot of this is really up to you know your experimentation so if you find a range and just kind of get somewhere in the middle of it you know use some of the tips that I gave if you hear the bit screaming if you see really really tiny chips increase the speed decrease the RPM increase the depth of cut you know, try things like that. If it's getting really, really chunky chips and you're getting a really scalloped edge, back off your speed, back off your RPM, maybe back off your depth of cut, you know, and kind of go that way. So there's unfortunately not like a, you know, definitive answer, but that, you know, doing that sort of average thing, you at least won't ruin the bit immediately when you, you know, when you first start coming with it. Great, thanks. Um, all right. Uh, let's say maybe we'll do one last question, and then we can uh, we can wrap it up here. Anybody else? All right. Well, hey guys, I uh, appreciate you all. Oh, oh one last question. Uh, by chip screaming, do you mean the the chatter sound it makes? So, um, I typically see the the screaming. So, let's say you are cutting um, cabinet parts, right? So, just big old rectangles. And you should be wearing your your protective headphones when you're, when you're doing this. And what I usually hear in the headphones when it's going along the straight lines, you hear a nice cutting sound. And it's a very, very hard to describe a sound, but it sort of sounds like a you know, and you can you can just tell the bit is not struggling, there's chips coming up from it, there's not a big cloud of sawdust. Um, you know, it's not burning, things like that. But sometimes when it gets into a corner, it'll start to go like that. And that's because when a bit gets into a corner, it has to slow down because it's making a corner. So your machine can't go like that or it'll stall out. Um, and a little screaming in a corner, like a lot of times with, um, you know, sort of classic spiral bits that are, you know, the kind of less expensive ones for plywood. No matter what you do, when you come into that corner on plywood, you're going to hear a little screaming. So it'll go and it'll come out. That's okay. What you don't want to hear is the entire time it's making that straight cut that the thing is screaming. And you'll hear it. It'll be like this loud, loud screaming, chirping noise. It'll sound very, very unpleasant. Um, you, you don't want to hear that. But a few chirps here and there is okay. Sometimes if you're cutting hardwood, if you're changing grain direction, you'll um, hear a little bit of that, but it should yeah, be the exception and not the rule. Um, all right. Well, I think that is a good place to leave it. Um, thank you guys very much for coming. We had, um, you know, a good majority of you guys who registered showed up. So we really appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to do another one of these things. Um, so I'll send you guys an email and if there's any, um, you know, I have messed up and broken a lot of things. Uh, so I'd be happy to impart some other knowledge to you. So if there's anything, any other requests you guys have, we can uh, do it by, um, by email. So with that, uh, I will let you guys get back to your day and uh, stay safe and go make something. Thank you guys very much. Have a good one.